Hello and welcome to episode 6 of Opera Vision's Next Generation series. I'm Nina Brazier, a stage director based in Frankfurt, and over this series we're diving into four European young artist programmes, exploring how the opera world is developing and nurturing the next generation of talent. From Opera for Peace to the Academia Rossignana at the Rossini Opera Festival, onto the Opera Studio at Oper Frankfurt and the Palau de les Arts in Valencia. We have backstage access to masterclasses, concerts, rehearsal rooms and dressing rooms and to finding out how the singers negotiate the physical and emotional highs and lows as they explore their unique operatic voice. Over the next few episodes, we're going to have deeper conversations with some of our young artists and experts. So today, we're back with Opera for Peace, chatting to a new young artist, a tenor, alongside Julia Lagauser, the founder and general director whom we first heard from back in episode one. Today we'll be hearing what our emerging artist Leonardo Sanchez took away from the experts he worked with, tips on balancing self-promotion and networking alongside the practical and creative demands of being an artist, and how Opera for Peace's Paris Academy will be different from their first one in Rome. As always, let's start with a few choice words from our guests. What are you communicating? What are you selling? Who are you and why? how can you change something? How can you contribute to the artistic world and move people? The first time that I listened to an operatic recording or something like that was because of my father. And he played a concert of the three tenors. I have to admit that I didn't find it particularly attractive as a Jenner. The first time I was telling my father something like, oh, this music, it's a little bit for old people, no? And then he was like, oh, you don't understand. Hello, everybody. My name is Leonardo Joel Sanchez Rosales. That's the full name. (laughs) But uh, my artistic name that I use is just Leonardo Sanchez. I am from Mexico. I am a tenor and I am 27 years old. I first met Leonardo at the Opera for Peace Academy in Rome last summer. I was in the beautiful Sala Pontificio and saw him moving the piano across the stage with co-founder and artistic and musical advisor Kamal Khan, ready for their rehearsal and concert. Leonardo and I caught up between his home in Madrid and mine in Frankfurt, and I asked him what he'd gained from his experience in Rome. The only thing I can say is I'm super grateful because they have gave me amazing opportunities not to work with amazing singers, really good teachers and and, and uh, to present myself in big stages. <laughs> I'm thinking about that intense week you had in Rome, and I'm wondering what that week perhaps offered you that perhaps you wouldn't get on a more classic young artist programme. Well, f- first thing is uh, we had so short time to prepare a lot of repertoire, and we were just three or two tenors, I think, in the programme, so we didn't present in the final concert all the things we were working on. But it was a lot of repertoire, so that thing was like pushing us to do our best. And then working with such names, no, like Kamal Khan, he's a legend in in America and also here in Europe for as a as a coach, no, for, with many singers. He just conducted now alternate with Placido Domingo in Operalia to conduct. So he's a legend. And Lawrence Brownlee one day, Angela Mead the next day, Ludovic Tessier. Thomas Hampson, so one day after the other. So to be prepared for them and still working for for the for a rep and then working for a final concert and reach, I think, all the people who were there. Let's head back to Rome and the masterclass where Larry Brownlee, one of the leading tenors of his generation, first heard Leonardo singing. Que le soudain 
So tell me, tell me what you think. Uh, How did it go for you? Uh, so I always feel in this area that there is um, this tradition, and I feel always obliged to do it sometimes. But the, the, the tradition of the B flat at the end, and I, I think in general, I start the aria always thinking already on the end. Yeah, yeah. That I start to overthink. Okay. Uh, but and, and I always try to make it at the very, very last moment, like the, 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 the diminuendo. But now, for example, that I a little bit, uh, I am not like on my best shape. Okay. I always prefer to go further with the forte. Okay. That's risky to do the diminuendo. I don't know what to yeah, do. Yeah. Looking back at that time, as you said, you're working with these incredible experts. What do you think has really stayed with you from that week that you learned or took away from those people? Well, it's a very difficult answer because I think the most important right now for me, and they were all talking about to know your instrument, to know your, your capacities and your weak points. I remember the first time we were talking with Ludovic Tessier, he was like, each instrument is different, so you cannot work in the way you work with a Verdian tenor with a Rossi or a Rossinian tenor. They have totally different instruments, and he was doing this comparison with cars. Then Angela said exactly the same, like, guys, you have to find your own path and get people that you trust for your instrument. And then Lawrence Bronley, also we were working a Levetois and he told me, your piano is not my piano, no? The voices are different. So I think the main knowledge that I got that week in general is that we have to find the individuality in the instrument of ourselves, no? Of each singer. I have to search for the particular things that it has and to work on the weak points but also to, to enrich the, the strong points of my voice. Take it to your teacher. Work on that. Because, I, I mean, because especially in the middle voice, if we sing too fat, as my teacher says, that gets us into trouble. Because we want to act... So, they say that tenors get paid for their high notes, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if, yeah. we, if we make them suffer because of what we're doing in the lower and middle voice, that's not good. Sometimes I'm not really sure how exactly to go to the diminuendo in these notes. What, the B-flat? Yeah. It's hard, but it's really about being engaged, I think, in your body and supporting all the way through. It's not, when you go high and you diminuendo, you need to think more and more and more engaged there, more and more supported, hmm. more and more grounded for me. But then that's the thing. If he's saying it's pianissimo, it doesn't have to be sung fortissimo. Okay. And there's a difference between trying to sing it mezzo piano and decrescendo to a piano, or mezzo forte. If you go from forte to try to go to piano, that's a long way to yeah. go, and it's really like nearly impossible to do in that moment. <laughs> it's from here. Larry Brownlee shows us how it's done. I recently met up with Julia in Frankfurt at Opera for Peace's benefit concert at Opera Frankfurt for human rights in Iran. Woman, life, freedom. We caught up once again on the line between Paris and Frankfurt. What had Julia learned from the first academy and how might the format change for the next one? Well, the Rome Academy was a huge celebration um, of all the things that we've, that we've been discussing and we gave the opportunity to 21 young artists to come and to learn and to participate in conferences and masterclasses and attend performances and, and a host of different things. We realised that this was a lot of work in the sense of we wanted to keep everything very balanced and very fair and give as much attention 
to each participant, to each artist, which of course with 21 artists was a little bit complicated. So for the next Academy in Paris, we're going to be reducing the number of artists to 12, which will give us a bigger capacity to work in depth with each artist to really allow them to develop and also for them to be able to go to their full potential because we feel that we're investing um, in people and talent and we also we expect to return on that investment in the sense of we want them to carry on um, the good work and to develop their own projects because we're going to be increasing our partnership with Opera Europa, with Opera Vision, um, with yourself to be able to broadcast what we do on a wider scale to the rest of the world. I know you're preparing for the next Opera for Peace Academy coming up in April. When and where is it? And what exactly are you looking for in an emerging artist? So following on from the huge success of the last Opera for Peace Academy in Rome, our next academy will be in Paris in April. And we have put together an amazing list of strategic partners. We have collaboration with the City Universitaire, which is one of the biggest campuses, universities in Paris with several houses related to different countries and their ethos is one of cultural coming together, which is exactly what we are doing with these academies. We also have a collaboration with the Ville de Paris, which includes events at the Eiffel Tower, which I'm particularly excited about. And we have strategic partnerships with other organisations, including Sciences Po, which is one of the leading universities and higher education institutions in France. We're looking for citizen artists. This is really something that we started with the first academy and which we will be pushing even more in the second academy. What does citizen artist mean? It means artists that recognise that they have responsibility in society and that they want to use their powers of communication and emotion that they give the public and their communities to bring forward creative solutions to big world problems, to try and create a better future for our business. So we're really pushing to get these like-minded artists to help us in our mission. Leonardo clearly fitted the bill for Opera for Peace last year, but music was not his first career choice. I was around 17 years old. I was not related at all with, with music. I was actually in the University of Medicine. But the first time I went to see an opera live I was Tosca. Then that changed my life because then in, in la with the orchestra, with the singers, with the choir, all the company, that was just incredible. And then I started to go in the weekend on, on the weekends uh, to a choir and I started my first year of, of music with 19. I changed uh, my career of medicine and I went to the University of Music. Was there a sense that you sort of needed to catch up because you didn't have this musical background, you hadn't had that sort of early training? Yeah, <laughs> it was complicated, of course, no, because I didn't have the previous musical education and I had to really, 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 really study hard because, you know, music, it's a language and I had to, to really like give it a chance to open my, my ears and open my mind and really go outside of my comfort zone because I was more used to read books and memorize what it's in the books. But somehow the singers, we have the same duty, no? Always to learn the roles by heart. The musicians for, from the orchestra, they, they are reading all the time and they need an amazing reading. But in the case of the singers, we need even more to work on the, the memory part, to learn by heart. Exactly. Did you find that your experience actually studying medicine, did that then support you in your training to be a singer in that memorization? It's really funny because 
the very first time, for example, that I started to sing something in German or in Russian that were uh, languages that I didn't know at all, I understood that as long as you understand more a language, your capacity to memorize it, to learn it by heart, increases. Because now that I, I speak fluently Italian or English or uh, my, my French is almost, it's almost ready you know, to be like good enough um, then I can I can learn the thing super fast now in those languages. Now that I am a speaker of a Latin language. And was there a moment where you felt that opera could really offer you a viable career? Yes, uh, it was when I was twenty one. The first time that I felt that sensation of viability, I was in Sinaloa in the north of the country, and I did uh, a competition that it's called the uh, International Competition of Singing in Sinaloa. And uh, it was my first experience singing in aria with an orchestra, and I arrived to the finals, and then the, the maestro, the conductor, he told me, like, oh, you have a future, a, a great future, like, just in front of you, take it, don't stop studying, blah, blah, blah. And I was the, the, I got the young prize uh, that time, because I was the youngest in the finals. And then uh, that was the, the moment that I said, like, okay, it's possible, no, for me to, to work and to live for the music and by the music. And what did you sing in that competition? What did you sing in the final? <laughs> in the final, we had to sing uh, two arias and I sang Dein ist mein ganzes Herz and Una furtiva lagrima. Oh, real crowd pleasers yeah. <laughs> there. Wonderful. Yeah. So this is one of these arias that can be very presentational. Oh, you just sing it, right? But it becomes special when you really allow these words to take life. Because the first word you say is l'amour. L'amour. There's a whole story in just that first phrase. Yeah. There's a lot there, and we, we, we tend to throw it away because we're like, Pare! that's all we were thinking about. <laughs> you know, everybody's yeah. like, waiting for the B-flat. The B-flat is less important than everything else. Okay. The same thing is true with a lot of arias. The high notes are icing on the cake. It's the cherry on the cake, but all of the information that comes before is what makes it much better. You're talking like, telling the sun to like come out and make her appear and that's what you're saying. You're like yeah. being extremely poetic in what you're saying. So you're not so controlled in the yeah. sense you're like, l'amour, l'amour, oui. No, something, a revelation happens. <sighs> Let it take hold. L'amour, oui, son So if I cut you off, have you already said enough to make me want to hear more? You should be able to answer yes. Yeah. Tu monetra, okay? If it's yeah. not, then you shouldn't be singing this. <laughs> L'amour. Yes. L'amour. Oui, sonarede a trouble tu monetra. Isn't that more interesting? Right? Keep going. And what is this? What is that? It's the light of the, of the window. Okay. Okay. And that, just how you said it, is how it should be. No. Because you have the opportunity later, right? And that makes it more interesting. Okay, let's, one more time, the lights. Be mesmerized by it. Where are we?
Easy. A little bit more. Okay. So, let me ask you. So, what is that at? Ah. Why does it not have to be so? Why do it have to be so? so sometimes I, I, I doubt if I don't support the first one that the other one will But it's come. not even a question of supporting for me. It's a yeah. question of, I don't want to use the word pushing, but over singing that note that this has less bloom than it can have. Okay. So there's a difference. Ah, what is it? Ah. Second one. Instead of Okay, you understand what I mean? Yeah, it yeah. You still are supporting it, but it, has a, it doesn't have to be Boom. punched. Yeah. Let, let's try. Okay, try it and see. Okay. And then that, I think that'll give you the chance to have more bloom on top. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You support it. Okay. Okay, but not. Make sense? Totally. Yeah. yeah. And it. You talk, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. Julia is, of course, someone with a clear sense of what it takes to have a viable operatic career and sees opera as a business. I asked her. What do you think that for singers or indeed other artists is perhaps the key to balancing the development of their voice and perhaps whatever productions or coachings they're involved in with that business side, whether that's the meeting people, whether that's the sort of the dreaded networking or whether that's social media and self-promotion? Because it is hard to sort of wear those two hats. What would you say with your kind of business sense is the best way to balancing those two things? I think the best way to consolidate everything is to make it into one hat. I don't think artists should see any of this as wearing two hats or three hats or juggling, you know, uh, 10 balls in the air. I think the most important thing and what I've been saying to artists and what I'm going to continue to say, and I'm actually currently writing a book about it, so there'll be more, there'll be more coming, stay tuned. The most important thing is to find your unique artistic identity. Once you've done that, then the idea of developing your voice whilst at the same time networking, which at the end of the day is just communicating who you are to different people, this will all come together because you're just being sincere. So, of course, you have to be organized. You have to get in order, you know, posting and social media and talking to different people and convincing people and auditioning and making sure that your art is, is at the pinnacle of, of what you can do. But once you understand who you are, why you're doing this, what you can uniquely offer based on your life and your past experiences, then all the different parts of the business will fall into place because people will understand who you are. Leonardo's Instagram feed reveals a strong sense of professionalism and authenticity. How does he balance his singing work with promoting it on social media? I think my favorite philosopher is George Frederick Hegel. And one thing that he is always talking about, it's contradiction. And he has this dialectic of the master and the slave and the dialectic uh, of the thesis and thesis and, and synthesis, right? So for me, sometimes to manage this balance, it's always like success. It's a very subjective thing no there are there, i have met people in in our career that they they need to find the balance between family and friends and professional careers so i've seen that everybody it's different so i try to adapt myself and to be open mind in order to to meet new people and also to to know myself i think it's a very important exercise especially for for singers no or for or for artists 
to do a autocritic all the time, not not auto sabotage because that that's uh, that can be super toxic, but an autocritic to ourselves and say, okay, I have these ideas of myself and I, I have to confront them with ideas of the teachers, of my friends, of the I, of the agent or this. It's a very complicated business, especially because we singers, we sell ourselves like a product somehow. We have to look good. We have to sing good. We have to learn languages. We have to be good at music. And <laughs> even sometimes with that, it's not enough because I don't know, the, the theater, they are looking for something else. But we also have to learn that sometimes it's not about that we are bad. They are just looking for other stuff, no? Like when you go to a shop or a restaurant, there are many, many dishes that you, you would like to get all of them. But sometimes you just have to choose one because that day probably you wanted to try that dish, no? Now, and I wanted to ask, I was doing a bit of Instagram stalking before our interview, <laughs> and you wrote after the Naya Stimmen competition, and I'm just going to quote you here if you don't mind. You said, I didn't manage to fulfil my personal expectations in the competition. What was your experience at that competition like? And what were those expectations you felt you didn't quite manage to fulfil? Naya Stimmen, it's a great, great, com great competition because it's really transparent i have to say so at the end of each audition you can go and see what was your grade and then the day before the finals to all the people who were in the semi-finals and we, that we didn't pass of course all the big names of the jury they were there open to talk to us and open with the truth no uh, eva maria Wieser, dominic mayer people like usually <laughs> couldn't access to and they were talking to us like regular people and that was fantastic the thing with Neustimmen was a little bit like I thought I would pass to the finals but then I think also I was not on my prime because three weeks before Neustimmen happened two, two, we, two weeks and a half I think my grandfather passed away who was like my biggest inspiration because I think I mostly sing because of him he's the only one in my family who sings on tune <laughs> or who was singing on tune. <laughs> My parents, they cannot. We say, <laughs> I always do this joke with them that, oh, you, you ring the bell and it's out of tune. <laughs> 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 and I, I really uh, wanted to arrive to the, to the finals. And then many people, agents, teachers, they all wrote me like, oh, why are, not, why are you not in the finals? We all thought like you would be in the finals. And of course, when we humans, we do expectations of things, the only thing is that we get hurt by them, no? But I have to say that it was a really good experience because thanks to that, I, I started to be in contact with a big agency and then with other uh, artistic directors because everybody were there, no? I asked if he'd been able to forgive himself for not living up to his own high expectations. The biggest thing with the stuff of my grandfather that, that is that he was a fighter. He always was like, do the best, never renounce to your dreams. So I was just remembering his words in order to try to accomplish uh, at least something in this, in this competition. The voice is related to the human emotions. I also remember the words of my grandfather and his attitude. Always fight and always try to keep going, no? Back in the Sala Pontificia in Rome, I enjoyed Leonardo performing some Puccini alongside soprano Anna Garottic. Now back to business with Julia Lagauzer. 
I'm thinking of you, Julia, as a great example to others, to me, to many people as a woman leading an operatic organisation. Now, as we know, there are far too few of you. And I know that in your work, you have to find serious amounts of funding. You have to reach out to banks, to business owners. You have to find and tap into relevant funding organisations. What is your approach to making these connections? Where do you begin with that? This has become a huge part of my work as General Director of of Opera for Peace. We're, of course, a non-profit organisation, which means that we live from donations and from partnerships. So, of course, I also had to learn how to ask for money. And there was a lot of trial and error. I think taking away from my experience, the most important thing is, of course, to show your passion and the importance of culture and what culture can offer and to showcase all the amazing artists we have and their stories and their difficulties and their successes. Of course, success stories ring true with everyone and uh, sponsors are no different. The most important thing is to show connections, is to show how artists are entrepreneurs, how they are no different, let's say, to other startups they're no different to other businesses so already the sponsor understands that there is an obvious link between their core business and between what we do we have a project as you know called circular culture which brings together the values of the circular economy and the performing arts and once businesses understand that we have the same values of solidarity and diversity equity inclusion as well as uh, sustainability then the next part is is pretty easy because what we can offer them is something different. It's it's emotion, it's events, it's coming together, it's opportunities for their clients to see a different side of what they do. But at the end of the day, we all have the same values. You mentioned there there was a lot of trial and error at the beginning. I wonder, is there a time you can tell us about where it didn't work and what you perhaps what you had to change about your approach? Oh, we had a lot of uh, a lot of times when maybe uh, things didn't work as much. In the beginning, I was talking more about culture, more about our specific world. And of course, if you're in front of someone, in front of a sponsor who maybe doesn't love opera as much as we do, then it kind of goes over over one's head, and they don't see the connection and see why they should care about opera, why they should care about culture. Um, But it was it was a learning curve. What do you hope will come out of the next Opera for Peace Academy in Paris? What would you say is your main ambition for it? I think my main ambition is to really build on what we started in Rome and go even further. And I'm really excited because I think we have the capacity through the City Universitaire, which is such a huge organisation, And, you know, through the 12 artists that we're going to be choosing in the in the next month. So stay tuned for more information on our social media channels about how to apply for this academy. And I'm hoping that we can go once again even further with this art, with these artists so that they can make a real concrete difference in our business. We don't need hundreds of people to do that, but if we have a certain core of people who are really working towards our values, then I think we can build on what we've already done and just go one step further. Let's end with some heartfelt words from Leonardo in response to the big question I put to all of my guests. What can we do to make the opera world a better place? Wow. (laughs) (laughs) I think the most important thing lacking of, it's empathy. It's really easy, and I have seen it many times, no, to point or to criticize or to make uh, prejudices of people that we know or colleagues or uh, artistic directors or musicians or whatever. In order to keep this, this business alive, there, there's a beautiful essay by Lev Trotsky. He talks about what is art, and he says that the main element of art is that it needs to be like pollution, it needs to to be contagious, no? So I think we it, it's our, our responsibility to, to be contagious with this love for opera. Thank 
Thank you so much to Julia Lagauzer and Leonardo Sanchez for joining me today on Opera Vision. And thanks to you for listening. There's plenty more online at operavision.eu where you can see the Opera for Peace masterclasses with Larry Brownlee and Thomas Hansen only available till the 26th of February. And to find out more about Opera for Peace's next academy in Paris, head over to operaforpeace.org. Also online is an evening of operetta and zarzuela from the young artists at the Palau de les Arts, the Academia Rossiniana's performance of Il Viaggio a Rems, and coming up in March, a soiree with the young artists from Oper Frankfurt, directed for the screen by me. I'll link to all those in the show notes and give information on the other music extracts you heard in this episode. We'll be back with Oper Frankfurt and Nombulelo Yende on the 1st of March. This series is edited and produced by Karen Piri and curated and hosted by me, Nina Brazier. Our provision is co-funded by the European Commission. <laughs> <laughs>